Molly draws something very important. O'Brien forgot his wife was pregnant. Oops. And Jake and Miles go over the interphasic coil scanner ODN recouplers and quantum flux regulator. Mark three. Hey, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. We're joined by a very special guest and friend of the show, Mr. Robert Hewitt-Wolf. Hey. All the way from cyberspace. <laughs> My name is Ryan T. Huss. Today, we're doing a quick review, fun review, awesome review of Deep Space Nine's season four, Hard Time. This was another very memorable episode. How are you guys doing? Doing good, doing good. Surviving. Doing good, yeah. Doing good. Nice. Actually, Ciroc's jacket almost matches uh, Ichar's face. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's close. It's close. A little bit. A little bit. Oh, I do want to give a, uh, before we get started, a quick shout out to uh, our good friends at Shout Factory, because I don't know if you've heard, you probably have, they have a new documentary called Woman in Motion, Nichelle Nichols, Star Trek, and the remaking of NASA. Check it out. Uh, I haven't seen it yet. I'm hearing a lot of really good things. Uh, quick, dis- quick description, the inspiring true story of how renowned Star Trek actress Nichelle Nichols pioneered the NASA recruiting program to hire people of color and the first female astronauts for the space agency in the late 1970s and 1980s. The film will be available in home theaters on digital and on demand everywhere right now. That's in my own words. So, <laughs> uh, also speaking of documentaries, we've got the Voyager documentary Indiegogo happening right now. Check it out. The seventh rule is extremely involved. I'm co-producing campaign managing. Ciroc is like in every event. We're going to do really cool stuff at Starfleet Academy. Let's talk about Deep Space Nine, shall we? Let's do that. All right. Hard Time, directed by Alexander Singer, teleplay by Mr. Robert Hewitt Wolf, story by Daniel Keyes Moran and Lynn Barker. I don't know them. Did they uh, pitch more than one? Uh, Daniel Keyes Moran is a science fiction novelist, mm. and uh, he was partnered with Lynn. I'm not quite sure how or what that how that came about, um, but they did get invited to pitch. I'm not sure whether they may have written uh, a spec together. I'm not sure. And they came in and pitched this to me. I feel like during season two. Wow. And then it really? took a long time to, uh, <laughs> to, to get it to uh, move forward. And I feel like they originally pitched it. I think it was a Bashir story, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. So don't, might have been a cure story. I, I can't even remember anymore. It's been a long time. Um, and uh, it took so long for me to kind of sell everyone on it that we lost track of them. Like we couldn't find them. They're they're this is back in the day, right? And and none of their none of their contact information was good anymore. Well, did you try Facebook? <laughs> yeah. No, there was no Facebook. There was no Twitter. There was barely an internet. Uh, so I think we ended up, I don't even know. I just asked Paramount to track the guy down. Cause I'd like, now I'd sold it essentially to Ira. And, and uh, I think they look for Daniel, not Lynn because Daniel uh, or Dan, I don't know sure what he goes by to be honest uh was is a novelist and and was probably a little easier to find Mm -hmm. i do remember one story where they did find a daniel moran in like new york and it wasn't him but it was a guy who was an ex nypd detective and like a pi and he offered to find him for us (laughs) (laughs) i I can find him for you though i can find him for you though you know i'm not him but i can find him for you uh (laughs) I don't know whether that's how they found him or not. I feel like they went through his publisher, right? You know, um, but uh, yeah, it was it was tough. And then we finally found him, and and you know he'd sort of given up. Uh, I'm speaking. I mostly spoke to him. I barely talked to Lynn. He and Lynn weren't working together anymore, so we had to like get make sure we got her paid too because they pitched it together in the first place. And he'd kind of given up on writing for the show in the interim. You know, it'd been two years. So I don't think he'd really even watch the show. And so, yeah, yeah, it was like a, it was a whole thing, but it all worked out. 
<laughs> sounds like a whole thing. It was. It was a thing. Uh, but it was a cool story. And, you know, um, and uh, I think it turned out to be a really good episode. You recall how he responded when you just kind of came out of nowhere and said, hey, a couple years later? I think he was surprised. And I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think he was a little pissed because there was actually a Voyager story that had some elements that were similar to this. And, and I think he had gotten it into his head that that maybe that it had been stolen for, for, from him in some way, shape or form. The episode was completely different. And, you know, we sort of, once we talked him down a little bit, it all worked out. Um, I can't think of the Voyager episode that would have these elements in it. Yeah, to... yeah, I don't really. It was a first season episode, I want to say. And mm -hmm. I don't really, or maybe a second season episode. And I have no idea what it, which one it was. But it was something about implanted memories as a punishment of some kind. Okay. Um, there was some version of that. Uh, anyway. Obviously, that wasn't the case. I was sitting on the story. I was trying to find him and <laughs> trying to sell air on it for, for two years and finally did. And yeah, so it all worked out. We worked it all out. Um, but yeah, it was just a little bit of more of an odyssey than usual to to actually buy the story. Usually it's pretty simple. Um, mm -hmm. And in the interim, I think also, you know, that kind of ate up a lot of our time. So that's why, I mean... Uh, Sometimes in, in these freelance situations, we offered the freelancer the chance to write the script. But in this case, you know, we'd sort of unfortunately eaten up all our time. And I, so I ended up writing myself. Since you brought up the uh, implanted memories, do you think that that's a more uh, humane way to punish people? Because my first thought immediately was, was like, wow, that's so cool. That's so humane. It's smart. They said it's financially better. There's all these things. I'm like, that's a great idea. Obviously, we don't have the technology now. I'm not pitching for it because we know that's impossible. But <laughs> but then when we saw what he goes through, that's that it's better for the family. The family gets to see him the next day, basically. I I think it's a fun. That's why I think it was an idea to do, you know. And I think that that was Dan and and Lynn's idea at the beginning. And I think that the idea is, yeah, it should sound like, okay, it's no big deal, right? You just had these fake memories put in. 20 years of fake memories, but for O'Brien, they're real. Right. And so yeah. memories of trauma doesn't, it doesn't really matter whether they're, they're, they're real or not. They're still traumatic memories. Right. Uh -huh. And that I think was what we, we thought was interesting to play with. And it does raise the question whether there is any such thing as a humane prison, you know, no matter how you do it. Um, uh, the memories they implanted were particularly brutal. It wasn't, it wasn't exactly like, you know, it wasn't club fed or anything like that. Um, <laughs> Do you think that they implant the memories of like HR and him doing this? Or do you think that O'Brien has control over the events? Like this is the likely culmination of how O'Brien would have acted in this situation, or are they just writing it and he's a passenger? I think it's probably a bit of a combination. I feel like it's probably scripted to a certain extent, but I think the outcome of how that's scripted uh, probably varies from patient or prisoner to prisoner, you know? And I think this is what, you know, this is, O'Brien would say, this is who I, this is me. I did this, right? This is, and I, so I think, I don't think it was completely, I think it's a video game in some ways, you know, it's a, it's a really small enclosed VR video game that they're putting in his head. And I think he does get to make decisions in it, you know, um, but it's a horrible situation. It's not like they're setting him into a situation, you know, <laughs> there are probably multiple points along the way where, where he could go, you know, he could do something horrible, you know, and, and, and O'Brien, held out against the horrors for a long, long time. Uh, you know, he didn't kill Ishar on the first day or anything, but, <laughs> but I think, um, I, th I, I suspect that while there's free will involved, I suspect that the vast majority of people who run through this particular scenario end up doing something horrible to either themselves or Ishar by the end of it. <laughs> so like, you know, so like bowling with the bumpers up. Yeah. 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 The ball's going down there, you know, <laughs> I think so. Like it's like uh, it's like when the when when you're playing D and D and the DM just wants you to do this scenario and has the dungeon all ready to go and like he's gonna make you do it, you know. So it's gonna be some variation of that. You're not going away from this because 
he or she is prepped and ready. And that's the scenario that's going to get run. <laughs> now you're talking Sorox language when you mentioned yeah. the Dragons. There you go. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, I'm all over that. <laughs> yeah. This is, uh, this is, you know, against the Frost Giants. You know, you're, you're going to fight the Frost Giants. You know, there's no other. He's, you're going to get railroaded into this because that's the one that he's got, he or she's got ready. <laughs> And now we're really going down a nerdy hole here. Deep, deep nerd. <laughs> deep nerd. I like it, I like it though. Okay. Mm. Uh, honestly, it's more like Tomb of Terrors, where we're, no matter what happens, everyone in the party is pretty much going to die. I mean, you know, it's it's that kind of scenario. There's not a lot of wins in this one, I suspect. I don't know what yeah. Tomb of Terrors means. It's a famously brutal dungeon where, where, where mm. almost always the player's are going to die and if they win in the very unlikely event that they win the treasure sucks and it's not worth it. <laughs> it's not worth it anyway <laughs> the only the only good answer to tomb of tomb of terrors i think it's tomb of terrors the only good answer is not to play like really like <laughs> just like nah i don't want to go in there what, why are we going in here this place sucks everybody watching the chat let us know if you know what tomb of terrors is let yeah, us know I, if you now I want to say I now want to look it up too and see if it's right. It might be Tomb of Horrors or something like that. They'll know. They'll get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty good. Worst D&D module ever. Drum roll, uh, please. Yeah, <laughs> what's the worst D&D adventure of all time? Heart of Nightfang Spire. No. <laughs> I don't know. Nah. Can't find All it. Right, we'll figure it out. Whatever. <laughs> uh, well, Ciroc, I don't know. What do you think of this episode? To me, it was a very memorable episode. And I like, as soon as I heard the title, I was like, oh, I bet it's the one where where Miles gets stuck in that thing for 20 years or whatever. Um, <laughs> it really like, it stands out to me. It's, it's because it's different than any episode we've seen in, in Deep Space Nine. It's this it's a totally different idea. It's a totally different theme. And it's another one that doesn't really have a B plot so much. I mean, it almost feels like, I, I don't know, maybe maybe you guys can speak on this better than I can, but it almost feels like the B plot is O'Brien's hallucinations of each R later on, you know. I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah, it, it, structurally, it doesn't really have a B story, you know. Structurally, it was it was the kind of story where it's tough to go to a B story, you know, right? Be, because the whole thing is about him being sort of stuck in his head and stuck in this moment and stuck in these in this situation. So you kind of want the audience to be there too. To, to cut away to a B story would probably let the tension out of it. We didn't do that all the time. It was rare that we did that, but we did it occasionally where we didn't. We just didn't have a B story. And uh, I think that this is one of those instances and it works. It works well, you know, I would say. Um, but yeah, there's no real official B story. That's for sure. Yeah, we just did mind. one that didn't have a B story, right? But I think it might have been rules of engagement or a session. One of them just didn't even have one. Well, it's because this has two stories built into it. There's the, the story that you see behind me and right. the story afterwards. So it already has two stories going simultaneously. Yeah, I mean, in a weird way, there, but the B story would be the flashbacks to Echar and the, and and the, and the memories, you know. But it, yeah, that it, it's just one of those episodes where we didn't do it. Like, like uh, I'm trying to think of another one, Little Green Men, right? It doesn't have a B story, I don't think. Well, the B story, I guess, would be the the people trying to bring them back. No, that wasn't even in. Little There's Green. no, I don't think there is you're anything right there. like yeah, that. Little right. Green Men. Yeah. Past tense, the B story is the people bring. That's what back, I was right? thinking. That's the one, yeah. Uh, but yeah, this one doesn't really have one, and it, it works without it. I think you know. Um, if you put in a B story, there wouldn't be enough to tell the actual story. And I, like I said, it would let all the, it would let the air out of the balloon. You know, Th this is really a story about a man trapped in a place and trapped in a moment. And so you, like I said, you want the audience to be along for that ride. And that B story cutting away to like, you know, Jake. Jake learning uh, learning how to like fight with a bat with from war or something like that wouldn't have been a <laughs> wouldn't have been very satisfying. <laughs> well, he did teach O'Brien about whatever it was that I said at the top. Uh, uh, interphasic coil spanner, ODN recoupler, and quantum flux regulator. Mark three. 
Sirach, do you remember that scene at all? Shooting? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, I do actually. And, and one of my headshots are actually used, is taken from this episode. So uh, while I was watching it, that was one thing that I noticed. So, hey, that's my headshot right there. <laughs> <laughs> So as I was watching it, I said, oh, they, they must have got it from here. That's pretty cool. Uh, but so, no, I, I do remember a little bit of it, but not too much of it. I mean, it was, it was just a few lines in this thing. Mm-hmm. And the tough lines were on a, or on Column for that one. How cool was it that Column just completely carried that? episode and you guys probably knew that he could already i mean i mean that's part of why we kept giving these kinds of episodes to him because you know he can carry the whole thing um and just because he's a terrific actor and and just you know could could carry the and could go to all the emotional places we wanted him to go which is why you know we used to call these like the o'brien must suffer episodes (laughs) that we would do like once a year um i didn't but realize re- you guys said that because the the whole I feel internet, like we did yeah or maybe the internet did <laughs> i don't know i don't remember what the origin of the term is but it's it's really a compliment to calm right you know because he just could just kill with these episodes he'd do such a great job but the other thing was the character was set up the best for it too because he had a wife pregnant wife yeah. young daughter you know and so the pro- if it were Bashir going through, which I think was who it was originally proposed for, he just doesn't, there aren't as many people like depending on him in the same way, you know? And even Cisco, I mean, Jake is old enough that when Cisco, there are some Cisco must suffer episodes too, you know? Uh, there's plenty of, plenty of crazy, I mean, in a weird way, like Visitor is a Cisco suffering episode, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't carry quite the same weight in some ways, just because Jake is by this point, Jake is like 16 years old. I think is that about right? 17, maybe about 16, 17. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. Somewhere in there. Right. So that character isn't as dependent on his father as like Molly and, and Keiko are like, you know, and, and Cisco's not married. So it just, just the stakes are clearer and strongest stronger with O'Brien, especially when when you do these kinds of episodes, because it's just so clear. Like if he doesn't get his his stuff together, he's not the only, (laughs) you could say it, (laughs) Eh, you know, whatever. Uh, He's not the only victim. Right. And, and, and that, that makes the episode more powerful. Yeah. Was Molly a victim or was she the villain? (laughs) Yeah. She's the antagonist. Very aggressive with her poor suffering dad. (laughs) She's like, daddy, to hurry up and look at my coloring. Oh, she's clearly, clearly the victim. Uh, we should have had Hannah on. Um, well, yeah, yeah, actually, Hannah's moving right now, so she's not really available to come on. But as we we're watching this, I was thinking, damn, I would have loved to have her because that she was also in one like just a couple weeks ago too. But they're moving. Um, but yeah, she she had a lot of scenes and a lot of lines, and she she even had like the the final moment. Uh, yeah, I, know, I really liked it. Yeah, but yeah, I, I, I mean, obviously, everyone in this is the victim, right? The the antagonists are mostly off screen for the entire episode. They're the bad guys just sort of do their thing and then split out in the teaser. They're done. Um, so it's really all about the 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 after effects, right? And that's what I really wanted to do an episode about. You know, I mean, this is obviously it's a lot of it is about PTSD. And, uh, which was not a super hip thing at the time to talk about, but it was in the consciousness, I think at least a little bit. You're right. We've made a lot of huge strides in that recently only. Uh, sorry, what were you saying, Strong? No, I, uh, Robert, you said PTSD and I just, you just kind of triggered something for me. I just wanted to know if that was what the impetus behind this whole episode was it was that the story you were trying to tell yeah that for me was was really what the story was about that was really i think what i was going for more than anything i mean you know um uh my wife uh at the time my wife still my wife but at the time my wife was a a psychotherapist so she was very familiar with that um and she was working with uh 
some high school kids who were struggling with some issues. Uh, my father was a was a war veteran, so he certainly had his demons. Right. And uh, yeah, that I think was really my interest in the episode more than anything was like as a cool way to sort of get into those effects of what happens to someone when they go through trauma and when they're struggling with trauma, you know, uh, with past trauma. Um, you know, yeah, so uh, that was really what it was, what it was about. Hold that thought. I definitely want to talk about that a bit more. We have to take our break super quick. The fastest break in uh, the world in the quadrant. Uh, I do want to give one final shout out to uh, the Indiegogo for the Voyager documentary. If you love the deep space nine documentary, if you love the captains, if you love chaos on the bridge or all these awesome documentaries by 455 films go check out the voyager documentary on indiegogo we have the uh link in the description box below check it out jump on it quickly make it happen it's voyager's turn we'll be right back on the seventh rule <laughs> 